Andrew Jackson called himself a Jeffersonian Democrat. Thomas Jefferson called Jackson a dangerous man. Thomas Jefferson didn't like men who bordered on fanaticism. And Jackson seemed to him to be, uh, at best, uncouth and at worst dangerous. But when you get right down to it, Jackson clearly was a lineal heir to the Jeffersonian legacy. Number seven, Andrew Jackson, Democrat, 1829 to 1837, 61 years old, from Tennessee. The hero of the common man, the old hero, old hickory. He was the type of man, it was a complex individual to say the least, as all great individuals are. He detested distinction of privilege. He really felt that he was a voice of the common man. But we mustn't misconstrue this. It doesn't mean that Jackson tried to uh, find out where public opinion was and then be guided by that. No. Jackson knew what he wanted to do and did it and then tried to enlist public opinion in support of what it was he wanted to do. Very few people were in between on, on Andrew Jackson. They either loved him or hated him. Andrew Jackson definitely captured the imagination of the common man. He was the first president to be born in a log cabin. He asked to be called General, not Mr. President. He chewed tobacco and smoked a pipe. He was a barroom brawler, a passionate Indian fighter, a gambler who brought his own racehorses to the White House, a duelist with two bullets in his body. A man who would fight at the drop of a hat, a man who considered personal honor above all else. He would challenge you to a duel or cane you in the public street if you said anything that reflected on his character, his honor, his integrity. He also had a furious temper, but he knew how to use it as a management tool. He would slam his fist and yell and scream, and then afterwards when everyone left, he would look to someone and says, they thought I was mad, and this was to get his way. I think a psychologist would have found him a troubled man and would probably have recommended uh, medication, but he wouldn't have taken it. <laughs> if politics is personal, it's very, very personal for Andrew Jackson. And it's possible to look at Andrew Jackson's presidency as a war against uh, a number of individuals. Jackson's war began the moment he took office. Invoking the adage, to the victors go the spoils, Jackson simply cleaned house, firing his enemies and hiring his friends. By doing so, he created the spoils system in Washington. But established Washington society, he soon learned, would not be conquered in a day. First month in the office, what does he come up against? The Battle of the Petticoats. This was an embarrassing scandal that erupted over the social status of Margaret Peggy Eaton, wife of Jackson's Secretary of War, John Eaton. She, like Rachel Jackson, had dated her future husband while still married to another man. Because of this, the wives of the other cabinet members, led by the wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun, refused to socialize with the Eatons. Jackson absolutely hated this. He had just lost his own wife. She too had been scorned by established society. And so Jackson had a great sympathy for Peggy Eaton. Jackson told his cabinet members that their wives had to socialize with the Eatons, but the women refused to budge. The standoff lasted nearly two years. Finally, out of pure frustration, Jackson asked his cabinet members to resign, which they did. I think that one incident alone, his inability to manage his cabinet, indicates a lack of judgment, a lack of administrative ability, a lack of skill. He managed by strong will and by punishment. After the Peggy Eaton affair, Jackson placed no trust in his cabinet secretaries, whom he regularly hired and fired. 
but he went through four secretaries of state. He went through five secretaries of the treasury, and so on. He was much more inclined to work through a group of informal advisors. This group of personal friends and political confidants soon became known as Jackson's Kitchen Cabinet. These were newspaper people, these were politicians, most of them uh, like Jackson from the West. Friends who got their name because they were said to come in the White House through the kitchen door. Other presidents had relied on personal friends for advice, but never to the extent which Jackson did. This angered his critics, but he didn't care. Jackson was determined to change Washington and America. And he did so with lightning speed. The first major piece of legislation that he recommended and got passed was uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This act empowered Jackson to forcibly evict all the Indian tribes living east of the Mississippi River. Five Indian nations were directly affected. The Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee. Of the five, the Cherokee tribe, located in Georgia, chose to fight the eviction in a surprising way. Instead of going on the war path the way their fathers and grandfathers might have done, this generation of Cherokee Indians took Georgia to court. The case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In an historic decision, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled in favor of the Cherokee, saying they did not have to move. But Andrew Jackson thought differently. Jackson said to Marshall, he made his ruling, now let him enforce it. The result was that they were rounded up at gunpoint and, and forced to move. Their property was seized and they were um, forced west. Of course, on the, the Cherokees forced march, uh, about one out of every four Cherokees died en route, which is why they call it the Trail of Tears. It is, without a doubt, the most controversial decision Jackson would make in his career. And it's one of the saddest chapters in American history. Soon after issuing the Indian Removal Act, Jackson faced a dangerous issue that threatened the fabric of the Union, the South Carolina nullification crisis. South Carolina was angry about the high federal tariff on imported goods, which helped New England at the expense of Southern planters. In response, South Carolina declared it had a right to nullify the federal tax. The person who articulated that theory of nullification most clearly was John C. Calhoun, Vice President of the United States. Jackson might have been more amenable to the argument that the tariff was too high, but he hated Calhoun because he thought he was uh, a personal enemy, and Jackson thrived on personal enemies. From a political standpoint, Calhoun believed Jackson would support him. They were both Southern planters, but Jackson's personal hatred of Calhoun precluded any political sympathy. Instead, he responded with force. Jackson threatened to have a civil war. He threatened to raise an army, go into South Carolina, hang John C. Calhoun from the first tree. Calhoun was said to have been genuinely scared for his life. But fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. South Carolina backed down, and Congress modified the tariff. As for Jackson, he made it clear that he was the supreme leader of the nation and that the Union was not going to fly apart under his watch. When Andrew Jackson ran for president in 1828, his opponents called him a jackass. Jackson liked the image so much, it became the mascot of the new Democratic Party. 1832, the last year of Andrew Jackson's first term, was a pivotal year in his presidency. After fighting petticoats, Indians, and secessionists, he suddenly faced his most daunting enemy, the Bank of the United States. The bank war was absolutely the central political uh, controversy of his administration. The bank war began in the summer of 1832, when Congress, led by Henry Clay, 
renewed the bank's charter, even though it wasn't due to expire until 1836. Clay pushed the bill through for political reasons and presented it to Jackson on the 4th of July. It's not immediately clear that Andrew Jackson has a problem with the bank, but once Henry Clay involves himself uh, in the bank recharter, then suddenly it becomes a battle royal uh, that Jackson has to involve himself in. Henry Clay was also running for president that year, and he was supported by the president of the Bank of the United States, a man named Nicholas Biddle. Both Clay and Biddle believed they could force Jackson to sign the bank bill. If he didn't, Clay would crush his bid for re-election. But the old general outflanked them. He's told that there is a cabal uh, between Biddle and Henry Clay. And once Jackson thinks of the bank in those terms, um, then this is something that absolutely has to be vanquished in his mind. It becomes, uh, in his term, the hydra-headed monster. He said to Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. Typical of Jackson, he personified the bank fight by waging war against one man, Nicholas Biddle. Jackson saw Biddle not only as his own personal enemy, but the enemy of the people. The United States of America wasn't big enough for both Andrew Jackson and Nicholas Biddle. And uh, Jackson wanted to make sure that uh, it was Biddle who lost power. Jackson vetoed the bank bill, returning it with a simple yet powerful note in which he stated, the bill to continue the Bank of the United States was presented to me on the 4th of July. Having considered it with that solemn regard to the principles of the Constitution which the day was calculated to inspire and come to the conclusion that it ought not to become a law, I herewith return it to the Senate in which it originated with my objections. Nicholas Biddle called Jackson's veto a manifesto of anarchy. Jackson called it his mandate for re-election. Jackson saw this as an opportunity to strike out for the power of the ordinary citizen by smashing what he called the monster bank. He saw it as an absolute mandate of the people that he was right uh, and the bank was wrong. In the end, Jackson's popularity won out. He crushed Clay in a landslide, then immediately moved on his mandate to close Biddle's bank. The bank still had four years left on its existing charter, and Jackson said, I don't want to wait four years. In the summer of 1833, while Congress was in recess, Jackson ordered his Treasury Secretary to redirect federal deposits from the Bank of the United States to various state banks. It was a very audacious move, in part because um, it wasn't even clear that what Jackson wanted to do was legal at all. His first secretary of the treasury wouldn't do it. He replaced him. The second secretary of the treasury wouldn't do it either. He fired him. So he went through three secretaries of the treasury before he installed one who would withdraw the money the way he was told. And when that was done, Jackson's enemies absolutely went ballistic. It was a power play of, of, uh, of ultimate dimension. When Congress returned and found out what Jackson had done, they censured him for his actions. The first and only president to be censured. As soon as the Democrats gained control of the Senate, however, they uh, had the censure not merely uh, rescinded, not merely repealed, but expunged, as if it had never taken place. By 1836, the Bank of the United States was dead. Unfortunately, Jackson did not have a substitute for the Bank of the United States, and this would uh, cause a lot of problems in Martin Van Buren's administration. Andrew Jackson's presidential legacy is, perhaps, the most complicated in American history. Without question, he changed the presidency, giving it more power by imposing his will on the economy, the government, the landscape, and the people. And by doing so, he forged the future of the nation. Jackson was the only president where a whole age would be named after him, the age of Jackson. 
and as one journalist would write, that the coming generations would be very proud to be born in the age of Jackson. But for the men who followed in his mighty wake, the age of Jackson would be a very bumpy ride. Under Andrew Jackson, the United States government was completely debt-free for the first and only time in history.